today about uh, our, our first long-term follow-up article, which was recently published in the journal Psychopharmacology. Uh, in order to put the article into context, uh, we do need to talk a little bit about the study that the um, article was following up on. So this is going to be a comprehensive talk where I will start from explaining what PTSD is and taking it all the way to how you can get involved as a volunteer or an intern. So uh, it will be context appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, I also should point out that uh, today is actually my uh, three year anniversary uh, with MAPS as a staff <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I started out as an intern at MAPS as well. And I was helping out with data management. And uh, it's really great that three years later, I actually got a co-authorship on a publication in a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> I think uh, it's a testament to what volunteers and interns can do at MAPS. Uh, it's really uh, great for career development, and I've actually helped place many interns uh, into jobs, uh, as well as graduate school, and uh, it's really great that, I, that we can help people that way as they help us. All right, so let's get going. Um, what is this pill? It's blood and lit up for some reason. All right, so in that pill is, we want you to think that is MDMA. And uh, that's actually not how the MDMA capsules look. They look pretty boring. <laughs> it's just a little capsule with some white powder in it. Um, but this white powder is actually capable of doing quite a lot of uh, very interesting things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. Alright, so let's start with PTSD. PTSD stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. And uh, generally, uh, it starts after a traumatic event. So examples of these traumatic events are depicted in the graphics below. And uh, there is no end to the list, in fact, because whatever is perceived as traumatic can in fact be a traumatic event. Um, and so after the event has taken place and passed, uh, often the fearful memories of this event do persist. And if the symptoms of these fearful memories don't resolve after one month, uh, that is justification for diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So in terms of the general population, about 10% of the population is unable to uh, get over the symptoms of experiencing a traumatic event and have a diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, in military personnel, potentially due to the higher rate of exposure to traumatic events, 14% uh, of military personnel returning from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a lot of people, millions of people almost. So, uh, essentially, the uh, prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder is heartbreaking and many of us are familiar or have friends or have heard about post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, one thing that actually is not often uh, publicized is that once someone gets post-traumatic stress disorder, they also have a whole host of other mental health um, problems that they end up experiencing. Uh, examples are depression, suicidal thoughts, and drug addiction. And uh, actually the rates are very high. So usually um, of, of the general population that has PTSD, approximately 85% also has depression. So this makes it very difficult to treat PTSD because um, we're, all of a sudden you're dealing with a whole package of symptoms that are heartbreaking and debilitating and people can't go to work, and they're pushing away their family members, and they're losing all of their social support network. So it's, it's really hard. So what we want to do is help these people as soon as we can. Um, another thing I want to emphasize is that the people in our studies have chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, which is uh, a, a certain percentage of the normal PTSD ends up enduring past six months. So in our trials, people have had PTSD for at least six months, 
but on average, they've had PTSD for 19 years. I want to take a moment to let that sink in. 19 years of PTSD, and oftentimes people don't even know what they were like before it. So it's a part of who they are. Um, and about one third of the population is actually resistant to existing treatments. So these include psychotherapy and Paxil and Zoloft, which are two antidepressants that are also approved for the treatment of PTSD. Uh, but about one third of the population, of all these people coming back from the war and all these people experiencing traumatic events in, the, in their daily lives, don't respond to treatment. So this is the one third of the population that we are focusing on. introduce you to MDMA. So it's a uh, 3,4 methylene dioxide methamphetamine. Uh, so if you look at the root of the word, you'll see that uh, MDMA has, is basically like methamphetamine, but it is a chemical cousin, essentially. So what that means is that there's additional chemical molecules on it that make it have different effects than methamphetamine. It was originally discovered by Merck Pharmaceuticals in 1912, and uh, in 1985 it was emergency scheduled as a Schedule One controlled substance. This means that it's illegal to currently use MDMA outside of a research setting in the United States. And based on how United States drug law is uh, formed and promoted, it is also a controlled substance in the rest of the world. So. Uh, the only legal way to do work with MDMA is through clinical trials. And uh, in order to do that, we filed an investigational new drug application with the FDA back in 2000, and they approved it in 2001. And since then, it's been an investigational drug in our clinical trials. So MDMA that we are talking about is 99.9% .9 pure. And we have done stability testing, uh, and it has great stability at room temperature. Um, so this is really good because uh, when hopefully the day comes and we will be manufacturing MDMA to market it as a prescription drug, that's great that it has really good stability. So it's administered in a clinical setting only, and it's in use as an adjunct to psychotherapy. So what this means is, uh, normal talk therapy that people are, you know, you go and see a therapist or a psychiatrist and you talk to them about your problems. Well, a normal person with PTSD can't do this because part of PTSD is avoiding the problems and it's being in denial and it makes it very difficult to treat the PTSD in a therapeutic context because you don't want to talk to your therapist about your problems. So. I also want to clarify from the graphic that MDMA is not ecstasy. So we know from uh, pill testing websites that about 62% of uh, drugs uh, called ecstasy that are submitted for pill testing contain no MDMA. So what else is it in that pill we don't know, unfortunately, um, and that's a really good reason to not go and try ecstasy. Um, I'm just going to get through the talk, but please save your questions, um, and I will get back to you. Is that cool? Alright. So, MDMA is not ecstasy. Now, uh, what does PTSD look like in a day-to-day -day experience? Well, there's hypervigilance. So, hypervigilance is essentially always being in the fight-or-flight mode. So, if someone touches you on the back, you freak out because you don't know if it's somebody in your daily life or if it's somebody from your past. And these memories of your past keep intrusively coming in and bothering you through your sleep, through your nightmares. I mean, maybe I should stop there. Okay, so... Um, anyway, so there, this does lead to a lot of anxiety and a lot of disturbed sleep. And one thing that we are doing in our clinical trials is really looking at sleep quality because it's so important to daily functioning. Um, in addition, it leads to defensiveness and emotional numbing. So uh, you lose trust in your surroundings and want to avoid social interactions whenever possible because you just don't trust them. Uh, 
uh, and many subjects are very overwhelmed by all of these symptoms, and some of them don't even know they have PTSD. They just know that's the way they are. Uh, so now along comes MDMA. The subjective effects of MDMA are to decrease fear and defensiveness, and you'll see that it's a really nice juxtaposition to the symptoms of PTSD. So there's, there's a theoretical basis, psychologically speaking, for trying MDMA treatments for PTSD. In, in addition, MDMA is known to increase trust and empathy. We know these from uh, research studies that have been done in healthy volunteers in uh, clinical lab settings, and they fill out lots of questionnaires, and from the, those questionnaires we know this is the effect of MDMA. So, also MDMA is known to promote affirming experiences. So that means that there's a lot more understanding going on interpersonally. Uh, in addition, MDMA seems to help with providing a more realistic perspective on your current surroundings and your daily life. Uh, it's gentle, but also profound. So what that means is it doesn't take you out of your mind when you're under the influence of it. You're just better able to see what's going on in your everyday life. Um, also, it's uh, possible to stay emotionally engaged while under the influence of MDMA, and it's actually a hallmark of the drug. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for uh, integrating insights that may be experienced uh, in a therapeutic context. So uh, up here I'm showing you a picture of the brain. The darkened part is the prefrontal cortex. That's actually the part of your brain that you tend to use for thinking. Uh, and also the lit up part that's in blue and orange, um, that's where uh, emotional memory processing happens, and it's actually kind of at the core of the brainstem, just above the brainstem. So uh, that structure is called the amygdala. The amygdala is very important. It's actually the part of the brain that helps you process things when you're in fight or flight mode. Uh, so if there's a predator and you're escaping from the predator, then the amygdala is processing things and linking them to the fact that you're being you know, followed by this predator. So it's a very primal part of the brain. Uh, so in the context of PTSD, the amygdala is hyperactive. So the uh, many memories that are being formed are actually getting linked to fearful emotions constantly and by this part of the brain. And this is, um, it's pathological, so it's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so then, also there's a, a decrease in the frontal cortex, the dark part of the brain. So what that means is, you're not thinking, you're acting. And that makes people really jumpy and, you know, causes all the hypervigilance and the hyperarousal state. So, uh, now what does MDMA do? We know from brain imaging studies that MDMA is capable of reducing activity in the amygdala. So that means it's helping to cut down on the, the fearful aspects of your memories and it also increases blood flow to the dark part on the brain image. So what that means is it's making you think more and act less. So how does it do it on a molecular level? Well, so MDMA basically turns on all the faucets in the brain. And the main faucet that it turns on is serotonin. And uh, there's two other signaling molecules, norepinephrine, which is uh, also known as uh, noradrenaline. So you'll be familiar with adrenaline from the fight or flight response, perhaps. Um, so it also causes the release of, nor of noradrenaline and, do and some dopamine, not a lot. Um, what this does is it causes a cascade. So that's why I have multiple arrows here. So the cascade of the signaling molecules then turns on prosocial hormones in the brain. So these are oxytocin, which is actually expressed uh, during lactation, uh, as well as uh, labor and delivery. Uh, and uh, it also causes arginine vasopressin, which also is kind of the sidekick of oxytocin, does similar things. Um, and uh, it also does influence cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So, Promoting the pro-social hormones then gives the em empathetic and antactogenic responses that are common in MDMA. So what this does is it increases trust and it reduces fearfulness. Um, and 
and especially in response to emotional faces. So there's been a lot of uh, brain imaging studies and also uh, just regular research studies without brain imaging that show that um, the re recognizing an emotional face is influenced by MDMA. So in a therapeutic context, you can imagine that your therapist will be trying to connect with you and you're going to have a different response to them under the influence of MDMA if you're a person that has PTSD. So this is context dependent. So we know that the pro-social hormones are actually um, influenced by the context. So now we're all in a big group, right? So everybody's kind of aware of each other. You know, we're all standing, having some nice drinks, enjoying some time with friends. All right, so this is a good setting for oxytocin and other pro-social hormones to be release and it helps you to connect with your fellow person next to you or across the room. So that context would be very different if you were in a prison cell, right? So if you gave somebody, and it's not generally advised to do clinical research with prisoners, so don't take this under that pretense. So um, so basically if you're, if you're in a totally hostile context, you're in a war zone or something like that, MDMA would probably not have the same effect. Um, so what this means is, in a clinical trial setting, we have to be very careful about how the set and the setting are arranged. And so I'm going to show you a picture coming up in a bit um, on what that might look like. So also, it's important to note that these pro-social hormones uh, can also be administered uh, through a nasal spray. And uh, that has also been shown to be kind of helpful for PTSD. It doesn't have as much of an effect. So this is the setting that the clinical trials, uh, some of our clinical trials, are being done in. And you'll see that it's a very welcoming environment. We have really nice therapists that are smiling at you, wanting to make a personal connection. Um, and they always have fresh flowers. So this is actually in uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, which is where I was born. Um, that's where the studies are done. And so uh, Michael Mitzhofer uh, started out as an emergency room doctor. So he, uh, you know, added a lot of safety uh, to the setting of the clinical trial. It made it possible to do this research uh, because he was there. Um, also, he's a psychiatrist. He had a secondary specialty as a psychiatrist, and he's also trained in alternative therapies like holotropic breathwork. Um, and currently, he's an assistant clinical professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, and actually, uh, the study is done in his private practice and is not affiliated with the university, but uh, since his publications, he was invited to become a clinical assistant professor. Uh, also, his wife, Annie Mitzhofer, is a psychiatric nurse. Uh, she's very used to dealing with difficult psychiatric cases, um, and it's testament that nurses are a huge part of our healthcare system that are very important to have around and really have involved in these processes. So she's also a holotropic breathwork practitioner. So how many of you guys are familiar with holotropic breathwork? Okay, so some of you. All right. So holotropic breathwork is actually a hyperventilating kind of different breathing style that um, I actually associated it with labor and delivery. When I was delivering my child, I did that, and it worked, and I didn't need drugs. So um, it's actually a way of inducing the same uh, response physiologically just by hyperventilating. It's very interesting, theoretically, um, but it also makes it so that uh, you know people like Michael and Annie can practice the skills of experiencing an altered state of consciousness and then take that experience and transfer it to working with people under the influence of MDMA. All right, so Annie and Michael developed this therapeutic approach based on holotropic breathwork. So they took what they knew about altered states and then transferred it into working with MDMA. So a really important part is that the therapeutic method is non-directed. So uh, something like, so their method would go something like this. A subject would say, oh man, I can't believe I killed all those people. And then they say, oh, you really can't believe you killed all those people. And then that triggers an understanding and a personal insight that wasn't there previously. So it's kind of a reflecting what's there back to the person 
without saying, oh, well, the reason you feel that way is because of this, this, and this. And uh, in a therapeutic context, I, how many of you have been to a therapist? Some? Okay, so some therapists will like to tell you what's wrong with you, right? And some therapists say, oh, and they take some notes. So it's kind of like in between that. All right, so um, also a, an interesting part of the therapeutic method that they developed, which is now called MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and we've written a treatment manual on how to do it. Um, and if you're curious about it, we're about to uh, issue a new revision, and Colin has been helping out with that. Um, all right, so it's important to be able to alternate between turning inward and not having to talk to someone, um, and also talking to someone. So it's, uh, it engages different parts of the brain at different times in different ways, and it's very fluid. And Michael has described it as kind of spiraling around the traumatic event, but not directly honing in on it. So I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, so important parts that are um, required to, to pay attention to in this therapeutic method are the creation of set and setting. You have to be in a welcoming, nice environment that makes you feel comfortable. And you also have to be mentally prepared for what is about to happen. So there has to be a lot of intention that is pre-developed prior to receiving the drug. So we call these preparatory psychotherapy sessions, and the goal of that is to basically really set this context for what's about to happen. Okay, so during the sessions, there's a lot of use of breath because of the holotropic breathwork orientation of Michael and Annie. Um, but it's also possible to incorporate other alternative therapy methods. So examples would be art therapy. Um, we've been experimenting with incorporating art therapy and maybe there's a lot of artists here because it's the first Friday. So who knew, right, that art was such a huge part of research now. Um, and also music. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of focus right now on figuring out what type of music is appropriate. Um, I would characterize Michael and Annie's music as being kind of new agey. Um, and also, you know, different people have different preferences and, the, and the subjects often bring in the music that they want to hear um, if they're particularly attached to it because it triggers certain memories. Um, also, there's a certain level of therapeutic touch. So some of you may be familiar with body work. Uh, you know, the most common form of that is massage. Uh, so there are uh, kind of a limited number of instances where therapeutic touch is really crucial because it really helps people to realize that uh, parts of their trauma is actually stored in parts of their body. So for example, somebody who's been through a car accident may have residual neck pain if, because they had whiplash during the car accident. And so when they're remembering their trauma, they might actually have pretty severe neck pain because all of a sudden they connect that there's this somatic component to their trauma. And this is uh, definitely you know, an existing uh, paradigm in uh, conventional therapies as well, but it's not really directly addressed. People tend to think of therapy as being for the mind and the brain, but not necessarily for the rest of the body. So it's really good to keep that in mind. Um, and then there's also a huge component of follow-up and integration that happens after the drug experience, which is, if not you know, equally, it's almost more important because uh, in the context of an altered state, people really need to uh, understand what is happening there, and that only happens through a thorough integration process. So, um, this is a diagram depicting the types of visits I was just telling you about. And um, I'm calling this slide an informed commitment because you will see this is a pretty long commitment. It's three to five months of seeing therapists potentially traveling across the country in order to participate in these visits. And um, it's a big deal. And if someone is not committed, they're not going to have that set and setting because they won't have the right intention going into what's going on. So um, we all we start off with, uh, at the beginning of the trial, there's a really uh, thorough informed consent process. So you may, some of you may have heard that clinical trials just have you sign a piece of paper and then 
you've like given up all your rights and you have to go through a trial. Well, it's not like that in this case. The informed consent process is about three hours, and there's a quiz, and you really have to know what you're getting into. So, um, so after the uh, informed consent process, then people go through all the assessments to establish medical and psychological eligibility. Um, this is a, a trial for really severely ill people that are chronic pain, um, and you know they have chronic PTSD, and they are not responding to the treatments. So we have to uh, confirm all of that before enrolling them. Uh, after they get enrolled, then they do the prep sessions where they really start to kind of get acquainted with what's going to happen. And then the triangles are the experimental sessions, which is uh, either MDMA or placebo, and there's a certain probability of getting one or the other, but you don't know what you're going to get. Um, in the case of this trial, it was a sugar pill that was the placebo, and it was kind of easy to tell what was the placebo and what wasn't. So that's something we're working on in future trials, and uh, we're going to figure out a way to ensure the blinding, and I see your question, I'm going to go back. Okay. So in that, in, there's two experimental sessions, and then each one is followed by three sessions of integration. So there's only two instances where the drug is given in the blinded part of the trial. After that, there's an assessment to figure out the results, and that's what I'm going to show you next. And then the blind is broken, so everybody finds out what was in that pill. So the lit up pill from the beginning, was it MDMA or was it placebo? Okay, so then if people receive placebo, they're actually given the option of going back through the trial with all the same procedures, but this time they know they will get MDMA. And this is an incentive to ensure that people don't drop out after the placebo sessions because it's actually very difficult to go through a placebo session because it's eight hours of sitting in a room with two therapists and you just don't really know what's happening and it's probably placebo but all these traumatic events and memories are coming up still and you can't do anything about it. So that's why placebo is very difficult in these trials. Okay, so it's great. People go back through and I'm going to show you the data on what happens when they go back through and receive any MA too. So, um, you know, this, this protocol was actually developed through a series of amendments to the initial protocol. Initially, the study was proposed to be a two-session study, uh, two sessions with either MDMA or placebo, but then we got to add on the crossover when it became apparent that MDMA wasn't going to kill anybody or make them into drug addicts. And so, um, so that was good. So we ended up getting additional data points from those people too. So, so then, after the study, 17 to 74 months later, depending on when the subject went through the trial, there's this range of data that I'm going to tell you about, which looks at the durability of the results. So this is the result from the treatment portion of the, the blinded part of the data before people cross over, right? So you can actually see that the placebo, which is in blue, um, did not go lower than the red line. What's that red line? That red line is the diagnostic cutoff for post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. So if you're under 50, you're good. If you're above 50, you still have PTSD. So you'll see that the MDMA group dropped quickly below the red line after a single session. One session of MDMA. That's it. And the preparation and the integration. It's a unit. Okay, so I uh, just want to point out the error bars represent standard deviation and not standard error. Um, and also, these results were significant at a key value of 0.015, and this is in a sample of 20 people. So these results are in a sample of 20, and they may not be generalizable to the general PTSD population, but this is a pilot study, and this was our first shot at trying to figure out the difference between MDMA and placebo. So we couldn't go ahead and give it to 200 people because what if there was a significant amount of risk? That would be a safety concern for FDA and then other trials would not be allowed to take place or they would just stop your trial before it was even done. I mean, that's what happens if there's safety concerns. So it's really good that in a 20 person sample we had no drug related serious adverse events. A serious adverse event is something that could be a death or almost a death or uh, cause birth defects or something like that. So none of that happened. It was great. Safety looks good. 
And then the crossover group also had a significant response. This time, after, um, and again, after the, this is not the same format as the previous slide, I just want to highlight that. So at the start of the trial, the crossover group was at 80. Remembering 50 is the diagnostic cutoff. And then stage two baseline is after they had been through the placebo version of the trial. So there was a little bit of a response, but not enough. And then after they went through the trial again, they also dropped below 50. So then all together, we have this group of people of 19 people that have essentially, at some point, either in the first part or the second part, received MDMA and not close to end, you know, because they received MDMA, we can follow all of them as a single group. Um, also, I just want to highlight that many people no longer qualified for a PTSD diagnosis after going through the study. So they've been through either the crossover or the regular part of the study. And at the beginning of the study, they all had PTSD. If they just had the placebo with psychotherapy, it's the light blue line, Many of them still had PTSD. Um, if they had MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, a very small proportion, less than 25% qualified for a PTSD diagnosis. Uh, the actual numbers are 83% of the subjects since the start of the trial no longer qualified for a PTSD diagnosis at the end. Now, what happens 3.8 years later on average? Almost four years. That's a really long time. It took us forever to do the trial. So, you know, it was a really long time. So now, what we see is that baseline, um, the bars show average data. So it's the group of subjects, not individual subjects. And the, uh, again, the error bars represent the variation within the group. So it'll kind of give you an idea of how much variation. Okay, so then, the study exits is after the crossover or the regular part of the study. And it was statistically identical 3.8 years later at the long-term follow-up. So the two dots above it um, are two people in the group of 19 that actually had a relapse. One of them, the highest data point there was about almost 90. And that was the first subject who went through the trial and hence had 74 months since their last MDMA. So that's a really long time. Um, and so it was you know, logical to think that maybe there could have been a relapse. And then we actually got permission from FDA to go and treat the people that relapsed to see if a single session with MDMA would be capable of bringing their symptoms back down and taking away the majority of the PTSD symptoms. So that's what this arrow is showing you, is that person who had a 90 got one additional session as a part of a separate clinical trial and then dropped to 25 again after one session. So we also did a qualitative questionnaire and uh, I just want to highlight that many benefits were reported by subjects, by the majority of subjects. Here's a list of all the benefits. Many of these actually directly pertain to PTSD symptoms, so that means that we're directly benefiting people on their PTSD symptoms that are going away. I only showed a portion of them, the rest are in the paper um, that we just published. And also the mean degree of benefit was 4.3 out of 5. So 58% uh, reported a very large benefit and this is really good because people still think of the trial as being very beneficial to them. Um, and actually, no subjects reported any harm from being in the trial. So I would love to show you another table that you can compare side by side, but no harms were reported, so I can't show them. Okay, so now what about medications? A lot of these subjects coming into the trials are taking a plethora of medications. And not all of them actually are even indicated or approved for PTSD. Uh, examples are antipsychotics. So antipsychotics are commonly prescribed uh, in the Veterans Administration system for the treatment of PTSD, but they are not approved for the treatment of PTSD. So this is what we call off-label use. Um, and you'll see that the percentage of subjects at before the study and after the study that were taking medications stayed the same. But what changed is the mean number of drugs they were taking. So people were taking a lot of different types of drugs at the beginning of the study, 
And that number went down on average, from 1.7 on average to 1.3 on average. And the reasons, this is really interesting to me, so the reasons that they're taking the medications, nobody listed post-traumatic stress disorder as a reason for taking medications after the study. So that's really good, because perhaps what we have done is taken away the PTSD, and then all the other problems that co-occur with PTSD, like the depression, the anxiety, the uh, you know insomnia, maybe those things kind of remain and, and do respond to treatment, and that's why they're taking the medications. But that remains to be elucidated in further studies. Um, in addition, many subjects were, uh, so all the subjects were in psychotherapy at some point in time in order to qualify for the study. Um, but uh, at baseline, 84% of them were in active therapy at the time of enrollment, and then they, um, they were allowed to keep going with their therapy during the trial. But you'll see that there was actually about a 50% reduction in uh, people who had to be in therapy after the trial. So that's actually really good because um, it seems like they were able to go without therapy after the trial. And I also want to highlight that a lot of the subjects started kind of engaging in holotropic breath work on the side, and we still count that as a therapy, but it hasn't. It doesn't have proven efficacy for PTSD. It's just uh, there's a possibility that they all of a sudden were able to really uh, personally grow and learn more about themselves, and that's why they went into holotropic breath work. Okay, so what about drug use? FDA was very concerned we were going to cause a bunch of drug addicts to come out of this study. Uh, so we were very careful to assess what happened after the study. One subject reported trying ecstasy on their own in a non-therapeutic setting, but they did ask their friends to act like a therapist, but it didn't really work, and they said that they would not try it again. Um, one subject reported trying mushrooms, did not say how frequently. Uh, eight subjects reported occasionally using marijuana, and they confirmed that they also used marijuana before the study, so we didn't really cause a lot of you know, drug addicts to come out of the trial. Um, and no, none of the subjects developed drug dependency after the study. So there's a difference between use and abuse, as, you know, you're Santa Cruz local, so I'm sure you know. Um, and now in future trials, we, we need to make sure that we track the drug and alcohol use before and after, so we have quantitative data to support this data. So what were the limitations? This is kind of like the disclaimer part of the um, presentation. So this is a small pilot study, only in 20 subjects. So we can't go off and decide PTSD should always be treated by MDMA before we do more studies. Um, also, not all of the subjects uh, completed the, uh, the clinical PTSD assessment. Only 16 out of the 19 completed it. So in the, in the publication, we assumed that the three people who did not do the PTSD assessment also relapsed, just so that we were doing conservative interpretation of the data. Um, also, there was a, a, a lot of variability in how much time had passed since the last MDMA psychotherapy session. So that range in, um, in time makes it hard to determine if there was an effect um, specifically. So in our, um, in our upcoming studies, we now do our follow-ups at 12 months for everyone, so that's removing a point of variability. Um, also, like I mentioned, some were, some were in therapy, some were receiving medication, so we don't know if the, uh, the low symptom maintenance was because of that or not. But all these people were treatment resistant and whatever they were doing before the study wasn't working for them, so if it's working for them now, that's great. Uh, all right, and then also um, we didn't really assess the reasons for being in therapy, and uh, also uh, you know just like all psychiatric clinical trials, our research relies on a clinician's assessment that is essentially a clinician going through a certain number of questions, and that's a compound when you're trying to say, well, is this really real? But the assessment that we used was the same assessment that was used for the approval of Paxil and Zoloft. So we're comparing apples to apples, and it's what we've got. Um, and this is just the single therapist team. So is this just the MDMA plus Mittoffer's effect? Well, it doesn't seem to be. We've tried a similar method 
a non-identical in Switzerland, and we still got uh, a similar effect in terms of the ratio between the groups, uh, although the results were not as significant, but that's fine for pilot studies. We're just trying to get an idea of the difference. Uh, here's the two publications referenced in this uh, presentation. And future directions. This is really exciting because we have many new studies that are starting, and we have multiple therapy teams, so we're going to actively be testing this MDMA plus Mitoffer effect. And uh, also, we have new studies um, in ongoing and in the planning phase for veterans and military personnel. Uh, we have larger studies that are actually statistically powered to uh, definitively show differences uh, in that sample. And also we have international trials coming up, and we have phase three clinical trials. So this is where you actually get to try this therapy in a large sample and really get it to the heart of the matter and go then for approval to FDA based on your data. Uh, and we're in the middle of establishing a bunch of institutional collaborations with major universities. So uh, another very interesting research question is, well, what else is there that's not being captured by these measures? And that's what we're going to find out by doing qualitative interviews with the subjects at the long-term follow-up and future studies. Um, and I already have about rest. So if you have any thoughts or questions, we are a local nonprofit. So here's our office address. You can come and volunteer or intern with us. Um, here's our number. And we have amazing websites that are, that are managed by our director of communications, Brad Burge, and Bryce Montgomery. Um, so there's a lot of res uh, resources out there. If you're curious, you can look into it. And also, you can come and see us at our conference in April. So this is going to feature a lot of cutting-edge research that's just been published, um, not just on MDMA, but many different types of psychedelics. There is going to be LSD talks. Um, psilocybin talks, which is the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. Um, there's probably going to be some marijuana talks, ayahuasca. There's a lot to look at and a lot to learn about. And if you are curious, I highly recommend coming to the conference. Thank you. And so